Cinema Jaws brought to you by Cards Against Humanity. Guess what? What, Matt? They asked us not to read an ad. Are you kidding me? I'm serious. That is so cool. Dead serious. Wow. Enjoy the show. You're listening to Cinema Jaw, the greatest movies podcast ever, recorded on location at Cards Against Humanity in Chicago. My name is Matt Kay, and with me is... Rai the Movie Guy. And sitting alongside us, as always, Matt, is Elias Rodriguez, local filmmaker. How's it going, Jawheads? This week on Cinema Jaw, Matt, you wouldn't believe it if I told you a, a certain podcast just vanished, would you? Insert X-Files theme song. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> we are actually covering, this is really interesting, we are covering movies based on urban legends. It is. It's very cool. It's a, it's a great topic. I love this kind of stuff. This is a two-fold topic here. Urban legends, it, it sort of fits well with October for sure. Halloween, Halloween movies. Yeah. Yes. And also, it fits well with the guest who's going to be joining us shortly, doesn't it? Yes. Yes, indeed. We have David Flora from the famous Blurry Photos podcast. He is a, uh, let's, we'll let him uh, describe his, his background, but he's a podcaster. They talk about cryptozoology, mysteries, urban legends, these types of things. Yeah. So. I was always a very big fan of unsolved mysteries when I was growing oh, up. Oh, yeah, me too. And I used to love when they would focus maybe not on a crime, but on something that had some sort of folklore behind it. Mm. Uh, those, those kind of stories, those urban legends always interested me. Me too. I actually think coming up with this list, and we'll talk about it when we get to our top five, mm -hmm. there haven't been enough good movies based on urban legends. I'd Agreed. like to see more. Hey, yeah. Hopefully a lot of filmmakers are listening and get to work, guys. Yes. Uh, besides that, uh, Elias, we got a lot more going on, do we not? Oh, yes. We're going eye for an eye on Suburbicon. And we have reviews of A Single Man, plus Ryan got out to the Chicago International Film Festival and he's got a couple of short reviews from that. Yes. We are recording this smack dab in the middle of the Chicago International Film Festival. We have a lot of film festivals in the city, Matt, throughout the year, but the Chicago is sort of the granddaddy of them all. This is the big one. Yeah, it's one of the bigger ones in the country. It frankly. is. Yeah. So i uh, got a couple reviews of that. Plus, as Elias mentioned, we are going eye for an eye on Suburbicon, starring Matt Damon, directed mm -hmm. by George Clooney. Good time to play Matt Damon, George Clooney movie trivia. Okay. Yourself versus David Flora. Sound good? It sounds good. Yeah. And I don't know if you saw this. I believe it is a Netflix movie. Throw it in the jaw box early. Wow. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a new Saw movie entitled Jigsaw. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I believe it's going to straight to Netflix. I no, believe. I think that, well, it might hit theaters. Can we throw that in the jaw box? Yeah, we'll throw that up. whole release of Jigsaw uh, in there. But I, I, I thought to myself, geez, the audacity of actually calling the Saw movie Jigsaw, like he's this main character, like, you know, like a, a Freddy or, uh, you know. Oh, no, I think he's earned it at this point, man. Oh. Yeah, like, seriously? Yeah, absolutely. He, yeah. he belongs in that horror pantheon of, of villains. Oh, no way. I mean, totally. the A, the Saw movies aren't even that good, and B, the villain <laughs> well, was the weakest part of the Saw movies. You know what? Save it. Cinema, Cinema War. War. Oh, you are going down, Matt Kay. I don't think so. Man, going to chop your arm off with a saw. I'm going to put you in some sort of death device. <laughs> man, oh man. David is going to have his hands full with that Cinema War. It is jam-packed, is it not, Always, man? as yes. always. So without further ado, let's get it going here. Let's bring in our guest. As you mentioned, Matt, David Flora is the co-host of Blurry Photos Podcast, which just recently won the best podcast in Chicago, according to the Reader Magazine here in Chicago. David Flora, welcome to Cinema Jaw. Aru! Hey guys, what's going on? Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Yeah, David is joining us uh, via Skype, but you are in Chicago, maybe the suburbs or the city somewhere? Yeah, just a little outside, so... Uh, I, I am I am still uh, I am still touched by Chicago. <laughs> nice, and, and that's where I wanted to start before we get to Blurry Photos podcast. Uh, I was reading your bio. You were actually born in Kentucky, but made your way to Chicago. Did you do, do that for theater work to become an actor, that kind of thing? I did. Yeah, uh, after college, I went uh, to Virginia uh, to do a theater internship there, and I was there for probably around I think it was six months or so. And, uh, and after that, I was just like, what do I do with my life? And kind of the choices before me were uh, New York for, you know, theater and, and the, the real grind of it, L.A. for the, the grind of film, or as, as it turned out, a friend of mine from school had moved to Chicago and was doing improv. 
and she was like, why don't you come to, to Chicago? You know, it's it's got a much more laid back theater and film scene. Uh, improv is huge. I, I had always been involved in uh, improv in college and stuff. So I, I decided to uh, pick up and pack a suitcase and put on my uh, UK Wildcats hat and come on up here. So that was in 2005. Good decision, man. I mean, and was that other friend of yours uh, your co-host? Uh, no, actually. Um, uh, Dave uh, Stecco, my co-host, actually is from Colorado, and he, uh, he, I think he moved here around the same time, but we actually didn't really um, meet or, or do um, any productions or anything together until, I want to say, maybe six years ago or so. Of course, Dave went through a lot of the uh, comedy stuff in Chicago, too, you know, Second City Conservatory and uh, did shows with an improv group, Damascus Steel. And that's where we actually met. Uh, I joined that improv group and then we started performing together and we we as a group decided to do a podcast. And this was, you know. This was five, six years ago, and it was the early days of, you know, podcasts for, for most people anyway. Oh, yeah. And we kind of just were – we didn't know what we were doing, sit around and joke around and talk. And, you know, there was no real format or real topic. We would just – we 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 thought we were so funny <laughs> yeah but um what happened was i eventually decided to start bringing weird topics to talk about uh and i would get out there and and talk about like uh fairies that people have seen messing around in their gardens and uh ufos that you know were were sighted over blah 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 and uh dave like really responded to that and and picked up you know on my stories and would always be like oh yeah i remember when this happened and uh this encounter was over here and this monster did this and and so we both you know kind of uh bonded over our love for the mysterious stuff and when that improv team kind of fell apart and and subsequently the pod that podcast we i i went to dave and i was like hey that was fun talking about that stuff would you like to do more? And he was like, of course. And so that's, uh, that was in 2012. Uh, and that's when we started this. And, and basically we just pick topics that are interesting to us that pertain to the supernatural cryptozoology, which is basically the study of hidden uh, or unknown creatures. Uh, and you know, you get stuff like Bigfoot, Chupacabra, and Nessie that fall into that category unsolved mysteries and historical stuff and people throughout history. And, and we tried to focus on things that not a lot of people covered. So you won't see us doing a Jack the Ripper. You won't see us doing a uh, Bermuda Triangle. You know, we might touch on those things to, as a reference for other topics, but we like to delve a little deeper into uh, some folklore and local mysteries and, and, um, a lot of pretty freaky true crime has some supernatural and paranormal um, facets of it. So we will, you know, we'll, we'll touch on just about everything. And it's basically we just want to learn more about the topic and we want to get to the bottom of stuff to see if there's anything to any of what people are saying. Uh, spoiler alert usually there's not. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was going to say, like, y you guys approach it, it with the perfect tone. It's not like hardcore skeptic, but you're not taking it too seriously either. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, sometimes the episodes, at least for me, like I've, I've le legitimately been creeped out. And I was going to ask you, has there ever been a topic that, that sort of stood out as scarier or freaked you out more than any of the others? There, there have been a number that are really bad to research at one in the morning. Yeah, uh, no <laughs> doubt, man. <laughs> but... Um, Usually for me, I get creeped out by the demonic possession type stuff. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it is about that. Maybe it's just the total loss of control, or you know, an, an entity that's supposed to be that much more powerful. You know, that can hold sway over somebody. Um, and and you know, none of it, none of it really has any scientific backing. But of course, the stories are the fun part, and the storytelling is what we love to do with it. So. Um, that that kind of stuff gets me. Uh, I know our listeners really have responded 
to there's there's one topic called the Hinterkaifeck murders. It was about a German family in uh, I, I want to say the early early twentieth century, like nineteen between nineteen ten nineteen twenty, I think. Okay. And this family was found murdered in their barn. There's you know like five five of them, men, women, and children, and uh, they were all killed with a. Uh, uh, um, what's called a mattock, which is you know kind of like half pickaxe, half shovel, and it looked like they'd been killed one by one, and yet there were no footprints going to or coming from the farm, oh, and wow. it looked like someone had been uh, residing in their house at least a day or two after the murders they determined to be uh, to to happen so just Oof. really freaky stuff like that you know is is uh, is good stuff yeah um, that'll keep you up at night yeah and i mean we we cover a, a, a wide and and then next week we'll talk about like mad roman emperors you know <laughs> and <laughs> kind of make fun of people who are like i just want to swim with naked little boys you know <laughs> yeah yeah now do you have some guests on the show also Every now and then we do. Uh, we like to sometimes get authors in there, you know, people that have spent a lot of time uh, talking about and researching these topics. And, we, you know, we don't always agree with, with them. Um, uh, but then again, we try to say, well, these people, maybe they've had experiences that we haven't had, you know, that has convinced them. And we always just like to uh, discuss things with them. Um and once a month, we usually try and get uh, a fellow uh, podcast or podcast or in there to um, to talk with us about kind of weird news and sciencey stuff that has gone on in the month. We call that our our bullstone episode, and it's basically making fun of Dave uh, Stecco because he he said something was bullstone once, meaning he he thought it was bullshit. Sure. <laughs> And I was like, well, Stein, Stein means stone, so <laughs> you're just saying bull stone. Uh, and, and so we, we use that as a, a platform to you know talk to other uh, podcasts and other people that share the interests and stuff too. But yeah. mainly it's just me and him uh, going through and you know doing what we can as, as everyman. <laughs> yeah. Well, while you're recording some of these episodes on strange and, and paranormal activity and, and that such, uh, do you ever have something strange happen while you guys are recording? Not really. We have had <laughs> a couple of times um, we, we've had equipment failures that I, I just would feel dirty attributing to the paranormal. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, sometimes we'll talk about uh, the subject. One, one subject was gremlins. We talked all about gremlins, uh, which were originally little beings that would mess with um, Air Force uh, sure, planes. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, and so it was often said. Well, if you if you get on the bad side of a gremlin, then he'll get in your uh, uh, in your equipment and mess it up. And um, I think we did have some some silliness happen <laughs> around that episode. Uh, one topic was real creepy, called the Dybbuk box, which is this old possessed Jewish wine cabinet. It was often – well, when I first heard the story, it was usually like if you even mention it, you know, stuff will start going wrong. You'll have, you know, bad luck basically. And I think we I think we had to restart once or twice during that. But <laughs> I would never say it was because <laughs> – Yeah. That's creepy though. That is. Yeah. Uh, very odd. This is just uh, timing-wise. Uh, just two days ago, I was listening to Billy Corgan of the Great Smashing Pumpkins. Oh, God. Why? He, he was on uh, – <laughs> Howard Stern, and he actually was telling a story, and even Howard couldn't get it fully out of him, but he says that he 100% saw a person shapeshift into a, a weird right. demon-like being well, like right a in front of his eyes. one of those things? Oh, my God. Wow. Dude, Billy Corgan. <laughs> it is, I, it is out there. Not to get into the weeds, I think he's wacky. Yeah, but you know what? They say he's got a good new record coming out, but anyway. <laughs> Yeah, he, he has become best friends with Alex Jones, who yeah. we just love to shit on <laughs> all the go. time. <laughs> Alex Jones believes in lizard people, so. He does. That's yeah. what I, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, a lizard, Hillary's a lizard person. <laughs> it's crazy yeah. stuff, man. So, okay, what, one other question I had for you, uh, David. On the website, if, if people check out uh, Blurry Photos, all the, all the, um, the, 
the images for the episodes and your header and stuff are Lego figures. And I just was wondering what the aesthetic choice was on that. Well, uh, I've got a lot. You might say I, I probably have an unhealthy, uh, <laughs> an unhealthy habit of buying the little mini figures that come out. Sure. Um, and that it, it sort of grew organically uh, because I would, in, in the earlier episodes, I would look for a picture of whatever we're we're covering, you know, uh, and and just post it with the episode to have a visual, and you know, eventually I started thinking, well, that's that's not cool like you know that's pro it's somebody else's work obviously and i need to figure out a way to to put some of my own work up um and it, eventually i just sort of started putting i got little lego figures of me and dave and i started putting those in uh situations like what we would talk about in the episode and that grew into basically for every episode now i make a scene uh out of legos and like badly photoshopped everything else like background and uh extra stuff in there and uh oh, don't and be modest just... i think they're awesome actually i really like oh, them. well thank you <laughs> yeah no I, I i feel like you know i haven't seen anybody else doing anything like that so i feel pretty good about it but yeah, uh it's unique it's it's fun yeah it's fun to do and i've got a lot of like period uh period clothing legos so <laughs> If we do end up talking about Roman stuff, well, I'll put us in, you know, sandals with a shield and spear and helmet. And, uh, you know, it, last I think the last episode we did um, a British murder mystery. So we I put us in Bobby uniforms. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Good stuff. That's fun. Yeah. So, David, for the listeners that want to check out the Blurry Photos podcast, where's the best place to do so online? You can uh, you can go to blurryphotos.org and that's uh, that's a website. We've got our full archives there. They're all for free. Um, you can also go to iTunes, Stitcher, wherever fine podcasts are free, and find us. We're on Libs Libsyn as well. Um, for uh, Android, you know, I think pod most people use Podcast Addict and and all that good stuff. So basically, if you if you search for Blurry Photos podcast, you can uh, you can find us. Sounds good. And also social media, uh, where's the best place uh, and handle, Twitter handle, all that stuff? Uh, for Facebook, we are Blurry Photos Podcast. Uh, and for Twitter, we're Blurry underscore photos. And uh, we've got a few episodes trying to get more episodes up on YouTube, and that's Blurry Photos Podcast as well. Awesome. Do it. Yes. Check it uh, out, guys. Now, we like to end all of our guest interviews with some silly cinema cues to get to know the guest through the eye of the lens. Elias, you got something for David? Yes. So, David, you were talking earlier about uh, your decision of what city to move to. So, in an alternate universe where you move to L.A. instead of Chicago, you're living the Hollywood lifestyle, and you have a totally different podcast. What is that podcast about? Oh, man. Well, I, d don't you have to do something vegan when you go there? <laughs> yeah, I think you do. V vegan, v uh, v vegan, vegan monsters. I don't know. <laughs> oh, it's only monsters that don't eat people. They only they're they're vegetarian. <laughs> no human product whatsoever. No, no human. Uh, no, maybe some bones or elbows, but you know, <laughs> El elbows are bones. I realize that. Awesome. <laughs> All right, so David is going to be sitting in on this entire job. I think, Matt, we got a great guest oh, to yes. cover urban legend movies, right? No, no doubt about it. I love it. Uh, brings us to a segment called Eye for an Eye, Elias. Eye for an Eye, interested or ignore, Suburbicon. Suburbicon is a peaceful, idyllic suburban community with affordable homes and manicured lawns. The perfect place to raise a family. And in the summer of 1959, the Lodge family is doing just that. But the tranquil surface masks a disturbing reality as husband and father Gardner Lodge must navigate the town's dark underbelly of betrayal, deceit, and violence. The film stars Matt Damon, Julianne Moore, and Oscar Isaac. It is written by the Coen brothers and directed by George Clooney. We throw it over to Ryan. I know I gave you a tough time. We went to war on George Clooney being a good director, bad director, so forth. Sure. That said, I, I, I am excited for this project. I love the idea that it is written by the Coen brothers. I think it has uh, a Coen brothers vibe more so than my complaint about George Clooney's. I don't see George Clooney's fingerprints on his films like I would say 
a Cohen Brothers. I don't know why the Coens wouldn't have just directed this themselves. I would have been even that much more excited. Mm -hmm. If anything, for me, Clooney's a little bit of like a downgrade of having just the Coen Brothers write it and direct it and have the same stars and everything. That would have me even more excited. All that said, trailer looks interesting. I'm there. Matt? I'm on the opposite side of that coin, big time. I think Clooney is the perfect director for this because... Now we get to see more Coen Brothers movies, right? Because they can't direct every idea they have, but now they have a, a director that they trust who's obviously got some talent and some name recognition behind him. So why not use George Clooney? He's perfect. You said he doesn't leave fingerprints? Good. I want a Coen Brothers movie, and now we can get more of them. I'm big time interested. David, interest or ignore on Suburbicon? You know, I, I love Coen Brothers movies. I love George Clooney. Um... I, I I I don't mind Matt Damon, <laughs> so I, uh, I I don't know that I would necessarily ever see something like this uh, with a plot like that normally. But if you say Coen Brothers and George Clooney have a hand in it, I think I'm in. Elias, you making this four for four? I am. Yeah, we talked about recently. I'm a huge fan of his uh, directing. I'm a little. Weird up by the character named Gardner Lodge. It's <laughs> a little weird. I don't know. Okay, but um, let's go for it. Yeah, four interested for Suburbicon. Yeah, if your last name was Lodge, would you really name your kid Gardner? <laughs> well, it's better than Steam. If, yeah, that's true. Or yeah. Ski. Sled. Ski Lodge. <laughs> Hunter. <laughs> Could have been worse. Could have been worse. Yeah. All right, four interested for Suburbicon. Hopefully, we get a review out uh, very soon. Hopefully, yeah, that's uh, our, our uh, next one. We're going to try to see that one. Genuinely excited. Yes. On Cinema Jaw here, I'm sure the Jawheads know we've been doing uh, a movie of the month pick, sure. and we are about to get to that. Uh, but first, I did get out to a couple of films here at the Chicago International Film Festival. Oh, did you? Yeah. And uh, this is running two weeks right here in Chicago. It's a great event. Uh, it started off with Marshall opening up the film festival. Uh, I focused on a couple of small independent films, and these are just very quick reviews. But uh, if it sounds interesting to you, write these titles down, and uh, you'll have to probably seek these out because they're definitely smaller films. The first one is entitled The Endless. And directors Justin Benson and Aaron Scott Moorhead, this is the duo met behind the 2014 horror slash love story Spring, mm -hmm. a film I have recommended here on Cinema Jaw. I did that during our uh, hidden gem horror films, Spring. Uh, they come back with a creepy cult film. This time, the two of them don't just direct a film, but they also star in it as two brothers who return to a commune or a cult that they have previously escaped. The movie opens with the brothers being sent a tape from the cult and deciding to return for just a day to see how everyone there is. Once there, some strange, scary, and supernatural-like events take place. Coming for a one day and leaving may not be as easy as the brothers think. Keep an eye open for this one. It's a good one. The Endless, it's called. That sounds awesome. Yes. The second one I checked out was uh, a foreign film, and since it is the Chicago International, I feel like it's a must to check yeah. out a foreign film. Uh, the film is entitled Four Hands. This is a thriller from Germany that reminded me a little of the plot from the film Blue Ruin. The story starts with two young sisters, they must be younger than 10 years old, being in the house while their parents are murdered. Flash forward 20 years, and the couple who murdered their parents, and it is a couple, are being paroled. One sister would like to not think about it and not think about the past at all and get on with her life. The old, older sister, though, wants to make sure the murderers cannot harm them or anyone else ever again. Themes of revenge are laced throughout, but this also takes a strange twist that makes this picture rather unique. Hmm. In the mood for a dark ride here, Matt, write this one down and give it a spin. Four hands from Germany. I like it. So uh, hopefully we'll catch a couple more before the festival runs out on next week's show. Sweet. Uh, as I said, we move on to our movie of the month. We apologize. We are combining September and October together uh, That's okay. for this one. We, we, look what we did. We had a week off. Mm -hmm. We did uh, a podcast remote from a haunted house. We had a live podcast at the podcast festival. And sure. it just got away from us. Yeah, we've been working. That's okay. But we did promise our movie of the month, A Single Man. And here it is. Each month... As Rai just said, we choose a movie that is easily accessible via streaming and review it along with the Jawheads. This month, we stream Colin Firth in A Single Man. 
Was it worth all the buzz? Yes, sir. You have indeed called the correct number. How may I help? Uh, this is Harold Ackerley. I'm Jim's cousin. Oh, of course. Yes. Uh, good evening, Mr. Ackerley. I'm afraid I'm calling with some bad news. Huh? There has been a car accident. An accident? There's been a lot of snow here lately, and the roads have been icy. On his way to town, Jim lost control of his car. Rye, a single man is a polished, deliberate, boring ass movie. Is it romantic? Yes, but I found it to be romantic on an eighth grade poetry level. The ending in particular was incredibly eye rolling. In A Single Man, we meet Colin Firth's character George, who we quickly learn is reeling and heartbroken over the loss of his partner of 16 years, Jim, who has died recently in a car crash. We learn all this from a crappy voiceover. Life has become meaningless for George without his love, and he has decided that on this day he will commit suicide and goes about putting his affairs in meticulous order. The thing about George is that he's a boring guy, straight-laced, stodgy, scotch, and books. The kind of boring that can appear sophisticated on the surface as it does to a student and slash love interest of the film, Kenny, the most interesting thing about George was his relationship with Jim, and now that that is over, he's really just plain boring. George's heartbreak would be touching if it weren't so cliché. There are genuine themes that get lightly brushed up against, such as fear. The film takes place during the Cuban Missile Crisis, just before the free love in 60s truly began. We're just starting to get an inkling of the cultural revolution that's to come what it means to be isolated, invisibility, and being gay. Yes, sadly, these themes are washed down with the scotch and cigarettes uh, and drown in George's titanic grief. Boo hoo. <laughs> I don't think anything new or interesting was said here. Director Tom Ford is known more for his luxury brands than his filmmaking, and his sensibility is extremely impeccable. Every item is top line, top shelf, and art directed to the point of being clinical. The performances are great here, particularly Colin Firth. I did enjoy uh, what Ford did with what I'm calling the color device uh, to highlight certain scenes, but I will not forgive this, the ironic end ending that had O. Henry rolling in his grave. It's not a good twist. It's eighth grade poetry. Whew. Matt, wow. I don't know what it it's is. Incendiary. I don't know what it is with <laughs> oh, you and man. Tom Ford movies. Tom Ford also directed Nocturnal Animals, and you know how me and Matt went... <laughs> toe-to-toe -to -toe on that. Uh, let me just say, this was a revisit for me, and I think I liked it more this time than I did before, and I loved it back then. Colin Firth, as you mentioned, amazing. As a grieving single man who lost his partner after 16 years in a car crash, the scene where he is given the news is so damn heartbreaking. I can't believe you weren't moved by that. I mean, you're, you're, you, you, you don't have a heart, I think. <laughs> oh, come on. That's especially, this for you. Whoa. Especially when he says he'll jump on a plane. He's talking to someone. This is his, his partner. Obviously, he's, he's gay. And, and they, his they husband. Lived, but we, I think we can Yes, have, yeah. yeah. And, and, and he says to this person on the phone, I don't know if they identify him as Jim's brother. It was his cousin. A cousin. Okay, cousin. He says to this uh, man, he says, you know, I'll jump on a plane and I'll head that way for the services. And the voice on the phone says, I'm sorry, it's for family only. Right. So it wasn't necessarily his husband. It wasn't legal marriage. Yeah, that scene is crushing. It, absolutely crushing. I, I mean, that was uh, amazing and, and acted so that it, it felt the weight of, of the whole thing right there. Um, Earth is great. The theme that we're all searching for a connection with another person, gay, straight, transgender, we all have the same need and want to find someone who understands us on a level no one else does. Mm -hmm. The work here by Tom Ford, I would say is brilliant. You did highlight the, the use of colors. The film's so stylish. It's, it's oh, absolutely yeah. amazing. And the, the colors, he uses them actually to express like happiness many times in the film. I, I think there's a couple of times where you see Colin Firth when he's in one of his depressed states and he almost looks gray. And at one point when uh, Kenny, who's played by Nicholas Holt, uh, his character walks into a bar and you literally see a change in the color over his face. Mm. Uh, it's like he, he switched, he switched the whole palette of the, of the scene. And all of a sudden you see that there's a chance for him to be happy again. I, I don't know. I mean, it's just, uh, 
a wonderful film. I, I can't recommend it enough. And then the ending comes along and poops on all of that. <laughs> Well, I mean, the ending, I think, it says something. Uh, and I was going oh, really? to say, uh, right, in closing. It was all just a dream. No. I mean, it's on that level. No, it's not. <laughs> in, it in closing, I would say we don't know how long we're going to be here. While we're here, we should be lucky enough to be in love and have a connection. I think that's sort of the point of the, uh, that whole ending. It's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Is that what the moral of the more, story is? More, more or less. I don't know, man. It, it just, it, nothing really happens in this film. It's a character study. And yeah, Colin Firth is great, but give me something to chew on here. Did if you, they okay. had gotten into those themes about how, how um, gay people were so mistreated that they couldn't even go to their partner's funeral, you know, that I thought think would have been more interesting. I get it. That's not what this movie was about. But I don't think it got there, and that ending is just unforgivable. Well, I think, too, I, the, the point of them not going through that topic is the point to sort of normalize the relationship of of him and, and Jim. I mean, this is let's just let's just look at it as one person. Doesn't matter if he's gay or straight, what the character study would be. So they're almost taking the fact that he's gay out of it in, in some degree. Tom Ford, start making some better movies. They uh, look good, but no. they're not saying much. <laughs> hey, okay, you mentioned, okay, he's going to commit suicide. And at one point, there's actually a, a little montage of him trying to do it. Right, was that the comedic it. relief in That the was film? supposed to be funny. I laughed. I, at one point, he gets crawls up into a sleeping bag to shoot himself. That was funny. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about a very serious topic, but I think Tom Ford threw in a little comedy there, so it broke up the seriousness of it for a little bit. Well, and we should mention that Tom Ford didn't write this. It's based on a novel. It is, right, by so. the same name. And Julianne Moore, we have not mentioned, plays Colin Firth's best friend. One of her most forgettable cameos of all time. It's not even a cameo. I would say it's a supporting role. It's more than a cameo. In a film with pretty much just one character, I mean, I guess you can call it a supporting role. All right. That one particular scene is, is fantastic. And maybe we'll go there a little bit more. <laughs> uh, yeah. So let's go positive. I know Matt was uh, crapping on stuff. Did you have any uh, scene that was your favorite? Sure. I mean, so all the scenes with George and Jim together, their love, I think, feels very genuine. And they were both excellent actors. If I had to pick one particular scene that I like the most, it is when George gets that phone call. Um, yeah, to, to, to see his pain and to hear how he has to keep it together on the phone, it was good. Yeah. It was a good moment. It, that, that, is, that is really top-notch acting. I mean, you can just, I mean, th this is like a long take on Colin Firth sure. as he's talking and soaking in this news that his lover of 16 years has is, is been killed mm -hmm. in a car crash. Oh, wow. Devastating. Love that particular scene. Also, probably... By far the best scene in the whole movie, I would agree. And then what I mentioned, Julianne Moore, he goes over there. Uh, and this is, again, he's about to kill himself. Uh, he's thinking about doing it. And Julianne Moore calls him, clearly a friend. And he says, all right, I'll come over and I'll have a drink. This is 1960. It's phenomenal. Those two look like they... It, this isn't like two actors that look like they're dressed up to be in the 60s. It looks like two genuine people in the 60s. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm talking about the set, the design, um, and, and they, they have a good time. And I think it's that moment where you realize, you know, that this character, as depressed as he is, can still find joy in life. And he's not getting that maybe on the, on the emotional level of finding someone that he's in love with at that moment, but at least from friendship. And I think that was an important scene. So I got you, nothing like that from that scene. <laughs> you said they looked like they were part of the period, so it wasn't like that Ben Affleck uh, gangster movie. Right. That you know how out of place he looked. Yeah. Just I didn't even see that movie. So but, can, yeah, can I just rebut David? I feel sorry that, that that we're sort of just going at each other in this one. But so first of all, it looked like a, a page out of uh, an old Playboy. Okay, so as far as being genuine 60s, how do you know you weren't there? It looked like everybody's <laughs> idyllic. It looked like Austin Powers, but, but Tom Ford it. Okay, so like way more tasteful. Um, <laughs> the, the, the characters are completely destroyed. There's nothing uplifting or, or meaningful going on. She wants him, basically. She, they at uh. one time had a heterosexual relationship together. So they're, they're like... Ships passing in the night, you can't get here from, you can't get there from here sort of relationship. It's just very frustrating, and I didn't like Julianne Moore's crappy accent. It, I ate it up. It, it stunk. <laughs> I loved it. And, and, and she has this, like, over-the-top laugh a couple of times. There's a couple of moments where she has this big, big laughter uh, scene, and it's hilarious. I enjoyed that moment. Mm, I like her better as Maud, uh, 
Oh my God! How could I forget Lebowski? Yeah. Maud Lebowski was uh, Matt. Was the ending your least favorite uh, scene? No, I hate the ending. Um, <laughs> oh, Jesus! But all the scenes with Kenny, the love interest, the, the, the student. Um, who? What was the actor's name? Nicholas Holt. Where'd they find this guy? What? Jeez, this, he's how did he get a X-Men job movie. with Colin? He's Firth? in your X Men movies. <laughs> well, isn't that Beast? Beast. Wow. <laughs> He's also in Warm Bodies. He's also... Oh, is he in Warm Bodies? Yeah. All right, so that redeems him a little bit. I love this guy. All right. He he sucked in this. I mean, those scenes were so clunky and and, um, awkward. They did not... I didn't buy his attraction to Colin Firth's character whatsoever. Could it have been the direction he received? I don't know. Colin Firth was nailing it. This guy, not so much. I don't know. I think he was supposed to be sort of naive, and, and it was supposed to be a little clunky as you like to say mm. it's because he was very young and he's coming on to his professor colin firth is his professor so imagine if you're a 19 year old kid you think that your professor is gay and maybe interested in you it's going to be a little awkward when you're 19 talking to an older man that you like and are not sure he has feelings for you i think they, they that was intentional Especially with finals next week. (laughs) (laughs) Well done. Yeah. Uh, Worst scene for me, I I don't know. This scene, I'm not, I think it was one of those after it ended. um, I wasn't quite sure why it was in there. And this was uh, a moment where Colin Firth is coming out of, I I think it's a, oh, he goes to buy bullets for his gun. Mm -hmm. Remember? And um, he comes out of the store and he sees a dog much like the one that him and Kenny had. That also. Oh, another point that I hated was the stupid dogs. And uh, <laughs> don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I love dogs. Boy, but, come on. How do you, how do you, you have get no that heart? Sentimental? You have no heart. And and but I I didn't. I actually didn't like this particular scene where he sees another dog just like it in a car in the parking lot, and he goes up there, and the girl. Uh, there's a lady that's like, oh, do you like these dogs? And it, it felt a little heavy-handed. Uh, we get the idea that he cared for these dogs. I thought that scene was just a little too much. It didn't need to be there. Yeah. It must really suck to lose your, your partner and your two pets, like, all in one fell swoop, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's like John Wick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not, not to bring it all the way down to John Wick level here. No, but, no, no, it's, it's a it, fair it, comparison. But it's just a fact, yeah. Do you see any movie influences? Uh, movie influences, no. But like I mentioned, Playboy advertising. It's oh, like Tom right. Ford opened an old issue of Playboy. Just one issue, probably from 1962. Maybe the September issue, October. And flipped through it and got all of the art direction for this movie. You say that like you remember that issue well. Those issues well. Encyclopedic memory. Well, I think the movie takes place in the fall. Oh, but man. I do remember that issue. I will say this. Yes, I actually didn't go movie influences either. I went with a television show, and that was uh-huh. Mad Men. So I, I looked it up. Mad Men started its run in 2007. This came out in 2009. So Mad Men had been on the air for a couple of years. That was that stylish um, you know, 50s into 60s look that they went for. It definitely uh, had that idea that he was going to try to glamorize that era. And that's what, exactly what Tom Ford did. He glamorized. I mean, it just looked cool. I wanted to just swirl a whiskey after I, I, I watched this movie. What did you learn from this movie? That good taste and visual design and fashion sense do not make you a filmmaker, but you could do worse than casting Colin Firth. <laughs> Uh, I actually uh, picked up on, on Matt's actor that he thought was clunky in here. I actually was reminded how good this Nicholas Holt is. I love him in here. I liked him. He's in Warm Bodies. He's in Mad Max Fury Road about a boy. Oh, and yeah. I kept thinking to myself, God, wow, yeah. this, I like this guy. I, I forget that he doesn't jump out at me at, at, as such a good actor. But was, when I saw him here, I was, was reminded was of Was he it. the main war yeah, boy? The Val- Val- yeah, Val- yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's versatile, this guy. All right, I'm starting to forgive him, yeah. but he's just not good here. I don't know. Uh, how about movie poster quotes? A single man is singularly boring. I went uh, a little bit something, a little bit better than that. I went, a single man is a beautiful movie about the beauty of love. I don't know about Let's assign story. some jaws here, Matt. <laughs> Two jaws. Wow. Three and a half for Rai the Movie Guy. Wow. Me and you and Tom Ford movies. Hey, it <laughs> looks beautiful, but that does not a story make. Sorry. All right. If you agree, disagree, you've seen the movie, uh, you just give us some feedback. Write us feedback at cinemajaw.com, or if you have Twitter pulled up, shoot us a tweet at cinemajaw. No urban legends in this movie, Matt. No. In, in <laughs> A Single Man. Um, 
But that is our topic this week because we have David Flora of the Blurry Photos podcast on who covers all these kinds of cool urban legends and such. Now, David, uh, you're going to get us started. We like to ask our guests, was this a fun list for you to come up with or did you have a difficult time coming up with the list? This was fun. Uh, the The only difficulties was just uh, when you when you look at these movies uh, and break them down, you know, what do you put in the urban legend bucket? What do you put in the ghost bucket? What do you put in the just thriller? You know, like so, just pulling from from the sources was was kind of hard, and I, I probably was a little too hard on. Uh, the the picks that I made, uh, but at the same time, I also feel like I picked ones that um, rang out rang true to me because of things that we've covered in our podcast uh, before. So uh, that's that's what I went with. It wasn't it wasn't that bad. All right, what do you got sitting at number five? All right, number five, I have the Mothman prophecies. I love this movie. Love the love the, the legend. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I do. See, uh, knowing knowing the legend of the Mothman, and I'll I'll do a real brief uh, synopsis for you. Uh, back in 1966, a couple of uh, teen groups of teens who were out necking in the woods, uh, they spotted this what they later described as a humanoid, uh, black winged, red glowing eyed creature that they they just happened upon on a back road and they took off and it chased them kept up with the car uh, going what they said was 100 miles per hour down the road this is west virginia by the way point pleasant west virginia which i'd like to see them get up to 100 on one of those roads but uh anyway um it sparked this uh town basically legend uh, about this creature that eventually became to be known as a harbinger of doom because in 1967, the Silver Bridge, which connected uh, Point Pleasant, West Virginia to Gallipolis, Ohio, uh, collapsed. And it, it killed 47 people and, and a lot of, you know, there was just, it was a, it was a huge tragedy. Well, people f said because the Mothman uh, disappeared after that, nobody saw him after that, they said he was the harbinger of doom for this town. And, you know, since then, the legend's grown. Uh, there's been Men in Black that's involved in the story now and weird UFO uh, anomalies uh, about it. And now people are seeing seeing what they describe as the Chicago Mothman uh, flying around downtown uh, Lakeshore Drive and, and Lincoln Park, all the way out to Tinley Park, like all I've, over the place. I, 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 I heard that, about that. I think that's just Matt Kay in his uh, black leather jacket. <laughs> <laughs> and drones. <laughs> but um, I see the movie, I have a problem with the movie because it it is very, and I hate to use the term, it's probably pretty trite, but it's very Hollywoodized. Uh, and Richard Gere basically is is the protagonist, I guess, uh, you know, of this town where a lot of weird stuff goes on. His wife dies in a, in a car wreck after having seen this being, this creature. And then it's sort of like a thriller that, uh, there's premonitions of the, the, the bridge collapse, but nobody really knows what they're like having visions of. Uh, and like, it, it does collapse and, and they can't figure out what's going on. There's weird, you know, like phone calls from no one and phone calls from someone. And like, you know, it phone calls it, from beyond phone calls from beyond. That was and, creepy. Yeah. And, and so what it is, is kind of standalone. Like, I feel like if they had gone after the legend of the Mothman itself and just, you know, told the story, uh, there's a lot of creepy stuff in the in the legend, um, and this is based on the works of John Keel, uh, who actually wrote the Mothman prophecies. So I feel like they kind of stuck their uh, uh, feet in the bucket a little too much um, okay. in the production of this one. But it's it's uh, it's top five for me. <laughs> yeah, gets us gets us started here. I'll, I'll go next. Is that okay, Matt? Yeah, for sure. All right, swings it over to my number five. And uh, as I mentioned, this was a, a thin list here for me. Okay. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, I, I do not have any honorable mentions, so I have my five. And at number five, probably not the best film uh, to mention on, on most top fives, probably the first time in Cinema Jaw history I'm mentioning this film. But I think when you're talking urban legends, mm -hmm. this fits the criteria. 1997, I had a crush on Jennifer Love Hewitt, and she was in the movie <laughs> I Know What You Did Last Summer. <laughs> yeah. 
A classic <laughs> urban legend. Um, this is Jennifer Love Hewitt. Listen to this cast, Matt. Um, Jennifer Love Hewitt, Freddie Prinze Jr., Ryan Felipe, Sarah Michelle Geller. I mean, this was 90s gold, yeah. right? If only the kid from Warm Bodies was in there, it would be perfect. <laughs> and it is... <laughs> It's based on the urban legend Hook is the name of the urban legend. Right. And basically, in a nutshell, in the movie, um, these uh, cast of friends are driving alongside a road. They accidentally hit a pedestrian, and they decide to... They leave it. The, they leave the body, or yeah. so, somehow you know what cover they're it actually up. going to do. They're going to then throw the body into the water. I, I believe it is is what it is. And then when they go to do that, they realize that the body it, that he was alive, that he was still alive. But they go ahead and they throw him in the water. And let's never speak of this again. Let's just leave and and not help anybody. And of course, uh, one year later, they get a note. One of the girls gets a note, and you know what it says on the note, Matt? You'll never believe it. What? What? What did it say? It actually said the title of the movie, which was. I know what you did last summer. No. <laughs> yes. So clever. And from there, the whole urban legend takes place. Obviously, this sort of curse of, of leaving this guy and right, right. who's the actual murderer and so forth. Right. So. Which it's, it's an ancient tale we've all heard since childhood. Yeah. That That's was, a good one, though. Yeah. My number five. Well done. Okay. That brings nice. it to my number five. And when you talk about Keith Gordon, there are really only two Who? films. Keith Gordon. There's really only two films worth mentioning. The Rodney Dangerfield classic, Back to School, and the 1983 Stephen King adaptation, Christine. Now, here's the thing. I had no idea that this was based on an urban legend until I started doing the research. And I just went straight down the rabbit hole on this legend. So we all know the story, right? It's about a car that gets possessed. Well, apparently, uh, that's a real thing. Like, this car is legendary in, like, auto gearhead circles. And it's been talked about, I guess the, the model of the car is like late 50s, early 60s. Yeah, that same Madman era. Um, so it's been around, this legend, at least since then, of a car who's possessed by some sort of spirit and gets jealous of her teenage owner to the point where it goes after somehow, like, girls that he tries to date, and stuff like that. The movie itself, uh, it's John Carpenter, so you could do it's worse. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, you could do way worse. Yeah, I think this was uh, a movie that... I saw at a young age that was very, had a huge impression on me. Sure. It scared the hell out of me, no doubt. I remember me and my dad watching it and being very scared of Christine. And Keith Gordon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, good stuff. We're into our fours. David, what do you got sitting there? All right. I uh, got the old classic Blair Witch Project. Love it. Uh, this is, I, I believe people have tied it to the legend of the Bell Witch of Adams, Tennessee. Have you guys heard about that? Uh, no. A little, but only uh, due to my fandom of the Blair Witch. So continue, yeah. by all means. It's uh, It was just a, um, well, a, a, a disincarnate uh, a spiritual entity that tormented this family back in um, uh, the early 1800s in this little community called uh, uh, Adams, Tennessee. And it, it basically was just going after the patriarch of the family and, and tormenting him. And, and eventually in some accounts it poisoned him um, and, and he died. But this is sort of, people have, have tied it to, or maybe they, they wrote it based on that legend where um, out in, you know, out in the woods, there's something there that is, is to basically tormenting people. It's creepy as hell. Uh, I remember I saw it in uh, high school and had to had to bring the dog uh, up into the bed that night uh, to <laughs> sure yeah <laughs> to sleep nice but uh, yeah yeah I, we love I it I think that one's in there nice That's a, I mean it was it was a movie moment there's no doubt about it Blair Witch is special uh, we <clears> swing <throat> it to my number four and I know I just mentioned I'd never have talked about I know what you did last summer on the podcast before and I know for a fact I've never talked about my number four either and this again as i just mentioned with christine was a film i saw when i was really young mm -hmm. my brother uh showed it to me and he would tell me like yes that really could happen if if this sort of thing took place and it scared the heck out of me um so forgive me if, if you've never seen this film 1980 the film is entitled alligator mm. do i anybody on this 
I've seen moments, parts of it. It's about the alligator gets flushed down the toilet. Right, and yeah. the whole idea is this legend, this idea that if you if you put down like a lizard down there, you know, if you had got like a, some type of lizard or an alligator or whatever it would be, any type of small animal, and you flushed them down the toilet, they would actually live down in the sewer system, and, and because of the stuff they're eating, they're almost become... Humans. Like a monster. Yeah, like, yeah, like, like, like Leonardo and, and so, Donatello. In 1980, the <laughs> film is entitled Alligator, and that's exactly what happens. A young girl gets a baby alligator uh, from down in Florida, comes back. Actually, it takes place in Chicago. She comes to her Chicago home, flushes this little alligator down the toilet. Twelve years go by. The alligator has been living in the sewer systems of Chicago and starting to now eat uh, sewer workers and uh, people that have to go down there for various reasons. I don't know why. Ever since then, I think alligators probably scare most people, but terrify the hell out of me. Whenever I, I see like alligator attacks in some of those natural uh, nature shows, mm. all those kind of things, I think alligators. Well, it, this preys, me the willies. This preys on a lot of fears, right? I mean, everybody's a little afraid of of sitting down on the toilet. It's a very vulnerable position, and we don't know what's down there. Um, and of course, nature. We're all afraid of big animals and and sh dude there's a lot of truth to this there are alligators in the sewers and what yeah this is an urban legend Matt. no no yes, it's it true. is there are alligators in the sewers no there is not hey legend confirmed no, it's happened it is not <laughs> happened it is not this Absolutely. is an urban legend this is myth you tell me that now i'm never going to the bathroom well again. there's alligators in the in the uh golf course for sure so yeah watch out wow all right that was my number four again i can't vouch for it now i haven't seen it since i was a kid. It sucks. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> but I loved it back then. All right. What do you got sitting at for, Matt? Um, at number four, I see. Okay. This film isn't based on an urban legend, but I think that within the film, they create an urban legend. So it sort of is about the topic of urban legend. We've talked about it a lot, so we don't have to belabor it. The ring. The, the whole thing with the tape and how the teenagers hear about it. The beginning of this movie sets up like a classic, like I, I know what you did last summer teen thriller and it goes in a totally different direction more toward mystery and ghosts but it starts with that urban legend and i think it did so probably better than a lot of other films sure did i always mention that had that extra feature on the dvd to watch the actual tape that they see in the movie and i, I couldn't get through it i was scared crazy yeah <laughs> sometimes i like to just put it on youtube and watch it on repeat <laughs> of course <laughs> <laughs> and dream about alligators in the sewers. Yep. <laughs> All right, David, what do you got sitting at three? Well, uh, you'll never believe this, but my number three was The Ring. Nice. nice. Um, <laughs> this one, uh, I, I found that it there was a story, an old ghost story, a Japanese ghost story that it was based on or, or supposedly, you know, drew from um, where this... Uh, this girl named Okiku was, uh, was the servant to a samurai. Uh, she loved him. He didn't love her back. And eventually he, he, she kind of pissed him off and he um, framed her for breaking a plate, which, I, you know, it, what a what a dishonor. Uh, and he ended up throwing her down a well. And then her ghost would come up out of the well every night and torment him and basically count plates out until she got to like the the plate that she broke like the the, the ninth plate that she broke or something like that yeah this makes then, perfect sense right you know and and then it would shatter and she would scream and he went insane and and died so you know fun fun stuff <laughs> that's awesome yeah happy ending the ring see it's based on some urban legend i like that it. i did not know that that makes me like it even more yes uh swings it over to my number three and it was mentioned already uh matt actually had this at his, his number four i do have 1983 john carpenter's christine a good pick yeah and uh exactly like you uh i wasn't 100 percent sure this was based on any type of real urban legend but uh yeah i mean you're you're right in the gearhead community and there, there's this idea too that uh just cursed cars not even just like one type of urban legend but the idea of like maybe you buy a car that actually had a murder take place in it uh and they're sort of known as demon cars like there is this urban legend out there that a car can be possessed or you know have some haunted, haunted yeah. uh type of possession so i i don't know that whole thing is pretty uh interesting because you never think that you're in danger when you're in your car it's usually in the house right sure you know or sitting on the toilet with the alligator but 
<laughs> Not in a car. Now no. it's the car, too. Yeah, no. yeah. I'm supposed to help you get away from that stuff. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that's where I had uh, Christine, my number three. Uh, what do you got sitting there, Matt? Uh, okay, at number three, and listen, I'm going to apologize right now if I'm stealing anybody's number one, because I think this is one of the quintessential urban legends of all time, definitely as far as horror goes. 1979's When a Stranger Calls. Mm. I, I, this is one that I remember being told at an extremely young age. I didn't see the movie until much later, but of course, it's the classic, uh, the babysitters watching the children alone in the house at night, other than the kids. She gets a call, uh, some sort of harassment, like, uh, you know, where are you, what are you wearing kind of stuff. Threatening calls. And so she finally calls the police, and they trace the call, and it's coming from inside the house, you know? <laughs> and wackiness ensues from there. The movie, <laughs> the movie delivers. I think there's some genuine scares. It's a classic. They remade it in 19, or, uh, 2006. Can we throw that in the jaw box? Yeah, throw it in the jaw box. Um, I have not seen the remake. So I'm going with the original. I have not seen either the original or the remake. Oh, um, it's a classic. Dude. And I saw this pop up on, on the list while doing some research and people talking about urban legends and such. And it intrigued me. So I may watch it before Halloween. So Yeah, I mean, listen, it's a 70s horror movie. So just know that going in. But it's a good one. I like it. All right, uh, David, we're into our twos. What do you got sitting there? All right. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull an audible. Um, I'm going to throw in Christine because I had it as my number one. Um, and, and apparently everybody loves it. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I mean, it's a great movie. But like you were saying, have you guys heard of the um, the legend of James Dean's car? No. No. Uh, so he drove this little, uh, I think it was a Porsche, and he called it Little Bastard. And it the, the legend, the urban legend of it was that it was possessed uh, by an evil spirit and ended up killing him. Uh, in in the head-on collision and then when someone bought the car when someone bought little bastard after that uh, they were loading it up on the uh, truck or, or however they were going to transport it and it fell off and crushed a guy's legs and then when they um, chopped it up for parts eventually and, and sent the parts out to different places uh, bad stuff happened to to whoever got the parts and you wow know, just that sort of stuff so uh, little bastard and james dean yeah Probably See? played into some of that. <laughs> yeah, I like that it. is really cool. Yeah, th it was definitely one while I was doing the research today. I was most intrigued about was these uh, possessed or haunted automobiles. It's it's a pretty great uh, urban legend. Um, yeah, freaks me out. Swings it over to my number two. I think it was last year that we did our hidden gems uh, horror films, and this film came up on my list. It is a 2009 documentary that I, I highly encourage people to check out. It is entitled Cropsy. Have you seen this one at all, David? I have not. I've heard of it. Okay. And, and okay, it basically is a, a documentary about the urban legend entitled Cropsy. And Cropsy is basically a boogeyman-like figure that terrorized Stanton Island, New York. And a, a bunch of kids had went missing, uh, had been abducted, murdered. Uh, and it was around uh, this this hospital for uh, mentally challenged kids, and this urban legend sprang up from all of these disappearances. And this is taking place like in the, in the late seventies, early eighties, and it was called Cropsy. And these filmmakers set out to originally sort of maybe debunk the urban legend Cropsy, but they end up as a good documentary does, I mean, it, it draws you into that, but it really does take a turn on trying to solve some of the actual crimes, not looking at it as this actual cropsy did it, but maybe actually finding, you know, who was actually mm. guilty. And so it's really interesting, but you do have mm. this whole urban legend myth uh, that starts the story and starts the film. Check it out. See if it's still streaming, uh, Elias. I think it was on either Netflix or Amazon Prime, Cropsy. I'll My number two. That's one I really have to catch up with, man. All right, so my number two is a film that has been called the scariest movie of all time, 1973, The Exorcist. Urban legend? So Where, where does it fit for urban legend? No, and, and this is one <laughs> that I've actually what? known about. There's, there's multitudes. Of, oh, of, her head did turn around 360 no. in the movie. Well, dude, it's like, I don't know. Were you there? I wasn't there. Um, there, there were 
a whole bunch of exorcist stories that this is sort of an amalgam of. And um, the original novel, which I, I forget what year that came out, but only a couple of years before the film, uh, which was, it was a huge hit, was based on some real life exorcism notes that the author found. And I'm not intimately familiar with the legend and it's changed over the years. But what's also interesting is all the curses and legends that came out of the production of the film. Like people mm. getting hurt or dying that were on set, stuff like that. So there's just a lot swirling around this movie. One of my favorites too. So yeah, I think it belongs on the list. Weak. Mm. Weak. You, you say it's weak, huh? <laughs> yeah. All for right. Well, just legend. wait till wait till right. I number one. All right. I here, will redeem myself. Here we are. It's it's number one time. Uh, David, what do you got sitting there? All right, my number one. I'm going with 1977's "The Hills Have Eyes." Oh, beautiful pick. Beautiful. And um, this is pretty directly pulled from the legend of Sonny Bean, who was a 16th century Scottish cannibal uh, who lived in a cave on the coast with his family, uh, and and ended up. And this is this is all legend now. You know they've tried to prove stuff, and they basically just have uh, stories of it going back to the 16th century, but no real 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 proof of stuff this guy sonny bean uh fathered like 20 some odd kids in in incest and uh they would attack people uh in the forest along the coast um just you know unwary travelers uh who they would basically kidnap back to the cave no one could ever find them because the tide would come in and, and the cave would be hidden and then Finally, one day, uh, somebody gets away, and they they come in with uh, a bunch of townspeople they, and dogs, and they find the cave, and it's just rotten with with blood and human body parts, and all these these people they finally capture and burn at the stake, and yeah, it's it's pretty harrowing, and and so the hills have eyes. Um, pretty pretty cool uh, adaptation of that where you know it's set in the southwest and uh, of america and uh, just can cannibals are freaky anyway sure oh, yeah. Uh, yeah no doubt no, yeah. no me gusta no me gusta yeah and that's another one they remade just recently right. yeah. yeah they did yeah. they did but you say go with the original wouldn't you man i like the original one because it's more it's more about the cannibal uh, aspect which ties back to the legend Sure. Uh, swings it over to my number one, and it was spoiled. And believe it or not, I hate when my number one gets spoiled by somebody else's number five. How embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> but it did happen this week. And I, I equate this to the, the fact that I, I went in with such low expectations for this movie, and I knew nothing of the urban legend. So David had his, this at number five on his list. I went to see The Mothman Prophecies, and literally never heard of the Mothman before. Uh, thought the movie actually looked rather cheesy before I was going to go see it. And stepped into, uh, I thought, a, a wonderful Richard Gere thriller. So my number one is the Mothman Prophecies. And I think what it did for like a movie fan-wise, since I'm not huge into urban legends, it's, it's one of those movies that got me to look up the Mothman Prophecies because yeah. I had not Great heard point. of it. Which is spooky. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, this was this idea. I was like, what was this? I mean this is the first I've ever heard of it. So it worked on a level for me anyways, uh, when I watched it, it's got Laura Linney in there as well. I was like, what's going on? I, 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 when it ended, I was like, wait, it's based on at least some truth or at least urban legend. And I went home and researched it and was even more creeped out by, you know, it's one of those, like you see it in the theater, you go home and now you're reading about these actual events that they're blaming on the Mothmen. And it's like, whoa, this is this is really weird. And I've I've revisited the film a second, maybe even a third time, and I, I still have a I have I have fun with it. It's a it's a thriller. It creeps me out too, man. I, I like it. Yeah. Um so Great that was points. yeah. My number one was the Mothman Prophecies. Nice, nice. All right, I guess that brings it to my number one. And and guys, when you're talking about urban legends, there's there's one who stands above all the others. Um his feet are a little bigger, and he's the granddaddy of all urban legends. And of course, I'm talking about Harry and the Hendersons. Listen, Bigfoot, okay? I mean, 
he is literally the poster child of of cryptozoology if not all urban legend of all time True. you know you can yep. make an argument for the loch ness monster but really it's bigfoot guys <laughs> he's more photogenic and harry and the hendersons is the best bigfoot movie ever made i'll agree with it yeah okay i mean john lithgow is in it and yep. listen i could watch john lithgow in anything i think he's amazing even in footloose okay <laughs> this could potentially be oh and the mom from even, a Christmas even story. In Bigfoot loose. Right. <laughs> and the Sorry. mom from a Christmas story also pops up in Harry and the Hendersons. And what else has she done? So this is a great movie for a lot of reasons. Yeah. I, I a lot of people think Bigfoot urban legend. Uh, after starting to do Cinema Jaw, I, I realized that Bigfoot is real and he had offspring. Matt K is, <laughs> is living proof. <laughs> Could be. Could be. Uh, any honorable mentions for you, David? No, I was I was kind of like you guys. It was it was hard to 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 pick from. You know, you don't want to go for the the old movie itself, urban right. legend, right? Uh, because nobody wants to see a dog get microwaved. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I guess not. <laughs> yeah. Well, if we missed your favorite movie about an urban legend. Uh, and you have Twitter pulled up. Shoot us a tweet at CinemaJaw. We'll retweet it. Or email feedback at CinemaJaw.com. We love getting that feedback. What we're going to do next is trivia. Matt K versus David in Matt Damon, George Clooney movie trivia, plus a cinema war looking at Jigsaw. We'll be right back on CinemaJaw. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the hey Jawheads, this is Matt Kay, and I just wanted to let you know, if you're a fan of Cinema Jaw, if you're a Jawhead, why not become a patron on Patreon? It's super easy. Go to patreon.com backslash Cinema Jaw. It's just like Kickstarter. There's different levels you can pledge, you know, fit your own budget. And you get cool rewards like t-shirts, Cinema Jaw flasks, and fun stuff like that. Plus, our undying gratitude and love. So, again... Check it out. It's patreon.com backslash cinema jaw. There's some cool stuff there, and we hope you will do it. Also, Jawheads, if you can't become a Patreon, but you still want to help the show, there are other ways you can do that. One of those is leaving us a review on iTunes. All those reviews do help attract new listeners, and that's what we want, more listeners. So please go to iTunes, leave us a review, and uh, we thank you. To get ourselves a treat. And we are back on Cinema Jaw, hanging out with Blurry Photos co-host David Flora. Uh, David, I have a co-host here, Matt Kay. We've been doing it for a very long time. Well, what, we what haven't we been on? doing it, Rye. We've been doing the show. Let's oh. be, let's be, you know, specific. Okay. Wow. You're, what? <laughs> Low brow Single humor. Man. Oh, yeah. 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 Low brow humor. Yeah, you were you were saying that Tom Ford's uh, was eighth grade poetry or whatever. <laughs> like, <laughs> he's terrible. I, I don't know how I, I put up with him this long. So that's what I was going to ask you. Uh, doing the show with a co-host, um, does it get uh, difficult at times, or are you guys pretty much on the same level when it comes to these urban legends? Oh, we're we're pretty much on the same level, and and we both always kind of land on. We want this stuff to be true, or we want to have an experience with this stuff, but we just haven't, and 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 we're too rational to you know uh, to dismiss facts when they're right in front of us. So <laughs> sure. we we both uh, luckily land on the same page. You know, I know that there are a lot of shows that uh, have one true believer, one true skeptic, and um, never the twain shall meet. But uh, Dave and I usually. Uh, discuss things pretty much in in uh, lockstep so and it, it works out i think that's good uh again for the jawheads listening that want to check out blurry photos podcast the best place to do so online uh itunes is a great place uh the blurry photos uh facebook page where you can find us at blurry photos podcast or just our website at blurry org. awesome Matt, before we get to trivia and before we get to Cinemore, we did throw a few items into the jaw box. And urban legend has it that Elias has three arms. <laughs> Let's open up that jaw box. What's your pleasure, Mr. Cotton? The box. We got the box! Oh, what's in the box? <laughs> <laughs> wow, Ray. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Prove that I'm wrong. Prove that I'm wrong. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> 
I was going to say, now, I wonder... please don't <laughs> prove that he's wrong, okay? <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. The mystery continues. Uh, so, Jigsaw, the movie, I... Not sure what you might have heard, Rai, but there is no tie to Netflix. Oh, I, it's I, uh, good thing. getting a theatrical release. Uh, let's see when the stranger calls. Uh, yes, there was a remake in two thousand and six. Oh, okay. I think I nailed it. Right in the ballpark, anyway. And is Cropsy streaming? Yes, on Prime. Ah, I thought that's where I caught it. I, I, it's one I really want to catch up with. Yeah, especially after this urban legend show. You got to watch Cropsy. I might. Yeah. <laughs> Was that everything? Yeah, a quick job box today. Yeah. Well, I mean, he can do a lot when he has three arms. You know what I mean? <laughs> he could get through a lot. So, um, Matt, we did get some nice feedback that uh, we wanted to uh, bring up. Yes, we did. Uh, a young lady by the name of Asanthi wrote in, and she did answer the riddle correctly. I won't spoil it, but uh, she went on to say, Guys, I have listened to many different podcasts over the last few years. I tend to try out many podcasts since my commute sucks. Oftentimes it will take well over an hour, sometimes an hour and a half to get home. Mornings are only 45 minutes. Not many podcasts run as smoothly or as entertaining as yours does. The banter, segments, and overall tone of the show make my Monday afternoon commute easier to get through. The commute seemed to drag on in the last year though. In the span of five months, my family lost my father and aunt along with three family friends. There's a tradition of sorts that during the first few weeks of mourning, you're not supposed to watch TV or listen to music. After the normal amount of time, I didn't have the heart to listen to any music. Either it was too happy or too sad for my brain to process, especially while driving in hellish traffic. I found that silence was a bit much, and I didn't always have someone to talk to during my commute. Your podcast got me through some tough times. The easy conversations and passion for movies that I share made the drive a little bit less frustrating. Oftentimes, it not only distracted me enough to not mind the traffic, but also let me focus on something other than the overwhelming sense of grief that I was feeling. Thank you to all the gentlemen of Cinema Jaw for putting on a great show each week. Basanthi from the suburbs of Washington, D.C. And I hope I'm saying your name right. Oh, that was a beautiful, beautiful wow. feedback. Very yeah. Good. That's honestly... The reason I do this show anyway to, to hear stuff like that so, I agree yeah. Um, yeah I know I we got that feedback and uh, we all read it and 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 we're touched and it makes us want to do a better show right for sure to keep going and to keep uh, everybody entertained that's why we do it it's fun no doubt and and I'm, I'm glad we could be there uh, Basanti it is it's, it's an honor yes so, thank you yeah thanks for writing in and thanks for all the jawheads who are writing in and yes the riddle is alive and well and that'll be coming up uh, soon so that was everything in the jaw box, Elias? That was all. Get back in there. Will do. Matt, it brings us to a segment called... Cinema War. It works like this. Me and Matt, we're fighting on a topic. David Flora is our guest, and he gets to play jury and tell the jawheads at home who he thinks won the Cinema War. It's important, because we're fighting for jaw time to rant and rave on whatever we want. <clears throat> Jigsaw has a new movie coming out. Elias? Today's Cinema War topic, with another Saw movie coming out, this time title after its main character, Jigsaw, it got us thinking. Is Jigsaw in the Horror Hall of Fame with the likes of Freddy, Jason, Michael Myers and such? Or is he still considered second tier? Matt, you'll be fighting Jigsaw is in the Hall of Fame. Rai, you'll be fighting Jigsaw still is second tier. Let this saw blade of a Cinema War begin. Rai... Stop being so stuck in the 80s and grow up. Just because something's new doesn't make it bad. And now with eight films to his name, the Jigsaw Killer isn't even that new. Time to give him a jacket and let him in the damn club. No chance, Matt. Let's put this into context. Michael Myers was chasing down Jamie Lee Curtis. Freddy Krueger killed Johnny Depp. And Jigsaw? Well, he could barely escape Danny Glover in the first film. Horror Hall of Famer, not a chance. There's some other really big stars in that first film. Um, None. Yes. The guy from None. Princess Bride. I thought you said big stars. He's an awesome. Okay. <laughs> we, cannot, we cannot go toe-to-toe -to -toe on who has the better filmography because all of those guys have some majestically bad entries. What we can argue, is he a worthy slasher? Kills in interesting and creative ways? Check. Hunts a particular type of victims? Check. Has a series of films and always somehow survives? Check. Yep. 
He's a slasher. Yeah, but Matt, when it comes to great horror franchises, most people have seen many of the films in a franchise. If you ask 10 people out on the street how many Saw films they have seen, the answer is going to be one. One good film, (laughs) not great, mind you, Matt, does not get you into the Horror Hall of Fame. Have you seen Saw 3? Nobody has. Yes, they have. There, there's, there's a fandom for Saw. And listen, I love Jason, Freddy, and Mike. Hell, even Chucky. But there's room for improvement. Jigsaw had interesting and new twisted motives and methods, as we saw in the first Saw film. And it was downright artsy, even. This guy is a shoe-in for the Pantheon. No, and see, I, I argue this point that you just made. What makes a great killer in these horror films is the way he goes about killing their victims. Jigsaw. Creative, yes, but as far as always using traps and such, does not actually have like a weapon like Freddy or Myers that you associate with him. Because of this, he does not belong to the horror elite. I think the puzzles are his weapon. Okay, I'll leave you with this. Any Halloween store, haunted house, or neighborhood with great decorations will have some reference to the Saw films and the Jigsaw Killer. That little marionette on the tricycle has entered the horror lexicon right next to vampires, Frankenstein, and the Wolfman. He's a famous monster, Ryan, like it or not. This was my last point as well, Matt. Every Halloween season, how many people do you actually see dressed up as Jigsaw? Plenty. Not that many at all. Even a franchise like Scream had more masks. Why? Because people don't identify with Jigsaw as the reason the Saw franchise worked. It was more the gimmick of what and how far you would go to survive. So if you go to vote Jigsaw in the Horror Hall of Fame, I may just have to saw off your arm. (laughs) We are buttonheads here as we do each and every week. We throw it to our guest, our jury. David, what did you think of this cinema war? Well, I'll tell you what, uh, a lot of good points raised. Uh, I I like, Matt, that uh, uh, you were saying Jigsaw, his weapon is his puzzles. Uh, I think it's it's uh, pretty interesting uh, and, and would be a, a definitely a different um, addition to the Pantheon um, were he put in there. But I think Rai's last two points really resonated with me. He does not have uh, a, an iconic weapon. And when you're in a pinch and chasing some uh, topless teenager, you don't want to uh, have to assemble an elaborate trap for them. You want to go after them and, and kill them, you know, with a, a, something in the, the back of the spine. Sure. Also, I haven't seen that many people uh, dressed up as uh, as Jigsaw in Halloween. I think that's a very uh, strong point that Rai uh, brought up, too. So I'm going to have to go yes. with Rai on this one. Yes. All Thank right, you. Ryan. Hey, it does happen once in a while. So you won the Cinema War that gives you 20 seconds to rant. Matt, I don't even need... <laughs> 20 seconds of jaw time for this particular rant. All I need is five seconds. Okay. Are you ready? And, and I hope you guys are with me on this. Harvey Weinstein, go screw yourself. <laughs> done. That's my rant. Well done. Pissed off. All yeah. right. Yeah, big so. All right, Matt, it brings us to trivia. All right. This is uh, always a fun point of, of the show. It is. Um, it, it, as we mentioned, Superbicon is the name of the film. Matt Damon is starring in it. George Clooney is directing it. So we're playing Matt Damon, George Clooney movie trivia. David, you're our guest. You get to choose if you want to go first or let Matt go first. There are steals. And if you get hung up on any one question, you get one trip to the ER for Elias Rodriguez. All right. Uh, I believe I will defer to Matt. Wow. All right. Wow. Question one over to Matt K. Matt Damon plays Jason Bourne in four of the five Bourne movies. What actor played the lead Aaron Cross in the Bourne Legacy, the only Bourne movie without Matt Damon? Can I just say Hawkeye? Or do I no. I use real name. You do. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy Renner. One to nothing, Matt K. Question two over to David. Earlier this year, Matt Damon was in a flop where he played a European warrior in China. Name the film. Well, that would be the the wildly um, uh, 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 not appropriated at all, I'm sure. Uh, Great Wall. That is correct. One to one. 
You see that, Matt? Mm -hmm. Uh, Question three, back over to you, Matt Kay. Okay. George Clooney has only worked with the great Wes Anderson one time. (sighs) Name the film. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh no! I got a, I got a sense that Dave might know this one. Um, just a premonition. I don't know where it came from. <laughs> Jesus. Um... <laughs> Legend has it that uh, Dave may know this one. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Burn, burn after reading, which I'm sure is wow. Cohen's. It's not. It's not even Wes That's Anderson. Cool. Yeah. Wow. Opens, uh, opens it up here. You, you, you got a chance for a steal, David. George Clooney has worked with Wes Anderson one time. Name the film. Okay. I believe it was the excellent film, The Fantastic Mr. Fox. Oh, man. I really <clears throat> stepped in the poop. Wow. Yes. <clears throat> you like The Fantastic Mr. Fox it's as fantastic. well. fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> The wolf scene at the end makes that movie. Oh, I love it. When when the wolf puts his uh, arm up. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Solidarity. <laughs> yep. It's the best. Uh, it is two to one. David and question four is over to him. I mean, he can break it open wide here, Matt. David, Matt Damon has appeared in one film that the Coen brothers directed. It came out in 2010. Name it. Hmm. Wow. I think I'm going to have to take my trip to the ER. Oh, trip to the ER. Question number four. Elias Rodriguez, what's the name of that Matt Damon Coen Brothers film? Your clue is it was a remake. <laughs> Jeez. Awesome. Not that it helps much more. <laughs> um, well, I think it helps. I mean, it depends how well you know the Coens, but they don't make a lot of remakes. So maybe true, it helps. True. Man. 2010, you said? Correct. Mm. Um. Uh, I I I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with um, Ocean's Eleven. Incorrect, Matt. You got a chance for a steal here. Yeah. And to tie it back up. Okay. 2010. It was a remake. Correct. Cohen Brothers. Matt Damon. Matt Damon. The Hills Have Eyes. <laughs> It's funny. We were just talking about that. <laughs> it's wrong. True grit. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, I tried to help you, David, when I uh, responded to Rye. True, true. <laughs> it's tough. Uh, these, these, these contestants are under heavy, heavy pressure. <laughs> it is still two to one, David. Question five now over to Matt K. Matt, last year, 2016, George Clooney starred as a television host who was taken hostage on live TV. The film was directed by Jodie Foster. What was the name of it? Oh, man. Nobody saw that. It was reviewed <laughs> It was reviewed here on Cinema Job. <laughs> by you? Yeah. All right. I'll right. go to the, the ER. movie. I saw it. Whoa. Question number five. Back-to-back ERs. What was the name of that George Clooney, Jodie Foster directed film? Your clue is had to do with a money investor. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Oh, man. It was, I he, can he, picture it, right? <laughs> right. He was like a mad money type guy doing all the, like, the stock picks on, on the TV show. Oh, man. Little Man Tate. <laughs> <laughs> Incorrect. David, you got a chance for a steal here. I am in the exact same uh, boat. I, I can picture everything about it, even the stupid trailers, and I can't even think of it. Even the even the graphic that came up with the the name of it, and I can't think of the name. Um, is it the the insider? No, we were looking for Money Monster. Ugh. Money Monster. Wow. What a <laughs> flop! What a dud. Yeah, I, I I know I did not like uh, care for the movie. All right, here it is. Anyways, it is two to one. David's still in the lead, and question six is over to David. But these are getting harder as we go along both here. Both so. lifelines are gone. Yes. Question six to you, David. George Clooney has won Oscar for acting. Name the film he won it for. Uh, oh, Clooney man. has won one Oscar for acting. What film did he win it for? God, I'm thinking of a couple. I, I, I'm going to go with uh, Michael Clayton. 
fantastic film. I love Michael Clayton, but he did not win for that. Mm. Matt, you got a chance for a steal and to tie it up. Okay. Uh, I mean, if it was up to me, he would have two. And the second one would be for Batman and Robin. <laughs> <laughs> um, was it uh, was it good night and good luck? Looking for was it Syriana? It was yes, Syriana, yes, <laughs> Syriana, supporting actor for George Clooney that year. He got a nomination for Good Night and Good Luck, didn't he? Um, I think he won director for that, didn't he? Just nominated, nominated for oh, director, okay. and he was also nominated for Michael Clayton, and sure. maybe even something else up in the air, I believe as well. Um, uh, all right. Anyways, here we are, two to one. David's still in the lead. Question seven over to Matt K. Matt. Matt Damon starred in one film that was directed by Robert De Niro. Really? It also had Angelina Jolie in it and was about the CIA. Oh. Name it. Damon Jolie, directed by De Niro. Yeah. Man, that's a title card right there. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. Salt. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> Shit, Incorrect. that's what I would have said. <laughs> See, it's not an outlandish guess. Makes sense. Uh, wow. Man. Uh, I didn't even... I can't even picture them together. Um, and Robert De Niro directed it? Correct. De Niro directed. Matt Damon, Angelina Jolie. It was about the, about the CIA. Oh, crap. Uh, I got keep... it. I'm oh going to go with the Rainmaker. It's the Good Shepherd. It is the Good Shepherd. God Too late, it. Matt. Too late. Wow. Here it is. Man, it, oh, man. <laughs> I mean, what a dud of a trivia between you two. It is right? two to one. Well, geez, man. Write some easier questions. Oh, for come God's on. I, I guarantee you right now that wherever the jawheads are listening to this, they're like, you buffoons. These are the easiest questions. You know, this is funny because we just came off a live show. Do you know how many people from that audience came up to me and said, damn, that trivia was really hard. I know. And I meant to make that one easy. That was the funny thing. <laughs> yeah. Epic <Almost> fail. Two. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Here it is. Two to one, David. Last question of the game is two, David. So you can win it on a walk-off. If, if not, you might give Matt a chance to tie it up. Question eight, David, is George Clooney worked with Mark Wahlberg in 1999's Three Kings? And again with him the very next year, 2000, in this film that also starred John C. Riley. Name the movie. Uh, Mark Wahlberg. George G Clooney. George Clooney and John C. Riley. In the year 2000. What year? 2000. <laughs> um, man, yeah, I, I have no clue. Uh, Solaris. Incorrect, Matt. You can tie it up here. Wow. Pressure's on. Clooney worked with Wahlberg in Three Kings in 99, and again with him in the year 2000. And also John C. Riley starred in this film. Name the movie. Jesus. Hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's not Wreck-It Ralph. <laughs> Seriously, I'm trying to think. Like, Okay, so the year 2000. Oh, my God. Wahlberg. What did he do back then? Nothing but crappy, like, action flicks. That's before we knew he could act. I guess Three Kings sort of... I don't know. Does the music video for Good Vibrations count? <laughs> Incorrect. Wow. This was the perfect answer. It was The Perfect Storm. Oh, oh yeah. Remember this movie? The Perfect Storm? They all Duh. go out fishing... Yeah. Not really. Is it, it was one of those in the series of like uh, the day after tomorrow and like very a lot of CGI effects with this big storm and you got like weather people. I remember they're they're looking at their their radars and they're uh, they see two different fronts coming in and then the big dramatic line. They're like oh, and everything pauses and they're like it's the perfect storm. <laughs> is this the one where Morgan Freeman is the no president? no no which one is that? Different. <laughs> That that's was deep impact. That's deep, deep impact. impact. Yeah. Same same movie. Why couldn't you have asked that question? <laughs> John, you win this one by default. I, I I think is the best way to say it. Uh, two to one. He he, he got, no. He he wins fair and square. Uh, yeah, but I mean, yeah, miss after miss after miss. You guys, holy. You're God. a terrible sure. writer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> virtual handshake. Virtual handshake, sir. Well done. Uh, if it came handshake. down to 
a tie. We call it a jawbreaker. This question would have been to David. Better actor, Matt Damon or George Clooney? Oh, I mean, George Clooney. <laughs> We'd give that to Matt Damon. I'm from Kentucky. I've got to represent. <laughs> the real jawbreaker was this age of John C. Riley closest to. Matt? Okay. Um, okay. John C. Riley, 49. Elias lock him in at 49. Dave, you got a guess? I would go with 58. Ooh. Wow. 58 for John C. Riley. Give that one to Matt K. 52. Uh. Yeah, see, I yeah, he's still a spring chicken. He's he's young. You know what I just heard? Forty is the is the old age of youth, and fifty is the youth of old age. I like beautiful. that. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. I just What's, turned forty, so I'm pondering for, this. Forty to fifty is the limbo of your life. <laughs> right. So enjoy being in limbo. <laughs> well, Matt, we're in limbo now as we end a, a great job here. <laughs> Indeed. Sorry, sorry, guys. I, I really took the air out of that <laughs> with such a pr- phenomenal trivia performance. Oh, man. <laughs> hey, we always got to thank our, our guest, and this was a, a total pleasure. Uh, thanks for coming on Cinema Jaws, David. Guys, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much. I really had a blast. Cool, man. Yeah. Looking forward to seeing you uh, next week. Oh, yeah. We have a meeting. That's <laughs> yeah, what he means. Yeah, so, yes, yeah, yes, yes, to everyone not in the know. We're yeah, gonna get Jesus. Together. What the heck? <laughs> Throwing the listeners all off. <laughs> I'm going to uh, wreck every trivia from now on. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Matt, we also got to thank all our sponsors. Yes, thanks to all the sponsors and the CPC who help us get those sponsors. We also got to thank the best in the biz, Lash Rodriguez. Thanks, folks. And the man behind the glass, Phil. Thanks, buddy. Not a problem. Thank you, guys. Nothing to plug back there? I, I guess like the same stuff I always have. So uh, my webcomic, 20-something angst, or my website, philfujiwara.com. The usual stuff, Instagram. Yeah, do it, guys. Yeah. Dude, check it out. Yeah. Check out Phil's webcomic. Yeah, definitely. I like it. I do, too. Yeah. Until next week, I'm Ryan the Movie Guy. I'm Matt. Hey, and, and keep, keep on John about, about the movies. movies.